Welcome to the Need to Know podcast from the Wilson Center, a podcast for policymakers available to everyone. Always informative, nonpartisan, and relevant, we go beyond the headlines to understand the trend lines in foreign policy. Welcome back to another episode of Need to Know. I'm your host, John Molesky. This is a special edition of Need to Know in the aftermath of Iran's attack on Israel, a largely unsuccessful attack because Israel and its allies intercepted more than 99% of the drones and missiles launched by the Islamic Republic. And as we sit here and record this episode, Israel says the attack will not go unanswered. So our guest, Marissa Kerma, is director of the Wilson Center's Middle East program. And I guess as we sit here, Marissa, a volatile situation, it could be changing as we speak. So we'll avoid talking about things happening on the ground. And I want to ask you to focus on some of the bigger questions. The first one is about Iran's decision to cross what had previously been this red line. Most of its interactions with Israel, its aggressions with Israel have been through proxies, so-called shadow war. Why now would they decide to launch a, a direct attack? They certainly changed the rules of engagement between um, uh, with Israel with this direct um, and unprecedented attack. Of course, from their standpoint, uh, they are they were exercising um, what any sovereign country would do um, in retaliation to the Israeli attack of their consulate in Damascus that killed seven uh, leaders of the Revolutionary Guard. And since all of this has started, since October 7th and the war in Gaza, uh, we've also seen, of course, as you mentioned, lots of proxy attacks, but also a lot of um, Israeli attacks against Iranian targets, um, as well as some U.S. Um, attacks as well, uh, in retaliation to some of the um, targeted attacks at uh, U.S. military personnel, as well as other military targets around the region. So uh, with that attack against the consulate in Damascus, the total number of uh, leaders from the Revolutionary Guard that have been killed is close to 18 or 19. And so for them, this particular attack um, at the consulate um, just kind of, you know, shifted the goalposts and they felt the need to respond directly, um, a very significant escalation in an already volatile uh, situation, given all the different fronts that we are looking at right now that are in war. Talk a bit about more about the implications for the region in terms of the fact that this was already a powder keg, and now it's even been inflamed to a, a greater degree. How tense are uh, the nations around the region that this could spill over into something epic? I think this past weekend has um, surpassed any other uh, sort of event in the last six months in terms of getting closer to an all-out war across the region. There was a lot of fear, uh, given the uncertainty of what will happen and how Israel will respond. Um, and I think uh, this is why we've been hearing from many of the region's leaders and governments about the need to, to de-escalate. We've also heard um, basically an international chorus uh, from Western governments, the EU, as well as the United States, to exercise restraint and to de-escalate and ensure that whatever response Israel decides on, and they have decided, as far as we know, that they will respond, uh, that it will not push the region further to the brink, closer to a wider conflict. No one can afford such a conflict, uh, John, especially at this time, you know, six months plus into the war in Gaza, since the horrific attacks of October 7th. And it's not just Gaza that is, um, you know, in conflict. There have been um, exchanges, military exchanges on Israel's northern border with Lebanon. Um, there have been some Hezbollah fighters that, that have been killed, but a lot of civilians were also killed and injured. Displacement on both sides in, in Israel and in Lebanon. And then we also see an uptick, um, a very worrisome uptick in settler violence in the West Bank. And so there are so many different fronts uh, that Israel is engaged in. Uh, there are many um, other issues, of course, in Syria, in Iraq, and in Yemen, given the proxies that Iran has been su supporting over the years. So it is an extremely worrisome situation. 
Marissa, how uh, optimistic should we be that uh, Israel may heed these global calls for restraint? I mean, using Gaza as the test case, Israel has done what it felt it needed to do in the face of criticism from its uh, most dedicated ally, the United States. Will it now respond to global calls for restraint? The hope is that it will heed all this advice, particularly from its key allies. I think this is a very important opportunity that Israel should not miss because this Iran attack garnered support internationally for Israel that it had lost over the last few months over the war it has conducted in Gaza with the killing of more than 35,000 people, the vast majority women and children, but also um, denying access to humanitarian aid to flow in as it should. Uh, with international organizations warning against famine, particularly in the northern part of Gaza. So all that has been regained with this attack. It sort of went back to being bo both the victor and the victim um, in this larger conflict. And if it does not heed this, this advice and it escalates further, then we're in, you know, then we're engaged in a never ending or vicious um, uh, circle of violence and escalation that will not uh, be in anyone's interest, particularly the neighboring countries who have who are already um, suffering on multiple levels, per, uh, uh, particularly when it comes to the economy. I mean, anyone who's looking at, uh, you know, watching the news, uh, whether you're a businessman or an investor, you're going to think twice and three times about engaging in any kind of business in the Middle East particularly the, the surrounding countries. Same goes with tourism. So it is a very precarious situation. I want to ask you about one of those surrounding countries, Jordan. Talk about a complicated situation and a rock and a hard place. It signed a, a treaty with Israel, shot down some of the projectiles from Iran, saying to protect their own citizens and their own airspace. Now critical that Israel may try to use the Iranian attack as a distraction from what's happening in Gaza. They really are doing quite the balancing act. Talk about the pressures on Jordan. It is a very delicate balancing act, particularly because it's Jordan's population has been um, basically protesting on the streets of Amman and other cities. Um, in Amman, uh, right, um, right across from the Israeli embassy, during Ramadan, almost on a daily basis, um, against this war. Uh, let's not forget Jordan hosts the largest number of Palestinian refugees. And those who are not refugees, they're descendants of refugees. And there have been so many intermarriages that everybody has a cousin or a friend who is from the West Bank or from Gaza, and uh, people are losing family members. Like, this is very personal. This is very real. It's not just a war next door. And, um, and so this is very difficult for Jordan, but the leadership and the government has always been steadfast and very strategic in the way that they conduct their foreign policy. So they shot down some of these drones. It was in Jordan's national interest to do so. It is what any sovereign country would have done. Um, and it's not just about, um, uh, you know, these missiles basically uh, uh, um, violating the, the Jordanian airspace. It's beyond that. It's also a very important contribution to de-escalation, which has been the key message from Jordan's King Abdullah, as well as the, uh, the government from day one. De-escalation is key because Jordan is, as you said, it's, it's you know, constantly having to um, strike this balancing act with all the different challenges. It also faces um, pro-Iranian militia uh, threats on the northern border with Syria as well as the eastern uh, border with Iraq. And so those are very significant threats, um, and that's why it has to constantly tread very carefully. You know, Marissa, you talk about the, the personal stakes that so many people have in a situation like this because of all of the integration of the communities and, and, the, and the, the countries. You know, another thing I think Americans may forget when we think about warfare and countries uh, sitting in this vast North American continent, we forget how geography factors into these things. I mean, the distance between Iran and Israel is roughly the distance between Washington, D.C. and Chicago. So mm -hmm. this is right next door in many ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, 
Um, I'm a native of Jordan, and when I used to take um, my American friends down to the Jordan River, you'd be standing on the you know Jordanian side, and you could very easily just walk over, like cross over, um, to to the West Bank, um, uh, and and you see the Israeli flag. Uh, so and so yes, it is very close to home for many people, uh, particularly when it comes to geographic proximity. So if any of these drones or missiles were not shot down and had fallen on uh, civilian centers in Jordan, they would have caused a lot more damage than we know. I want to ask you about the, the long game from the perspective of the United States. Uh, President Biden has been steadfast in his commitment to Israel, even while he and his Secretary of State and others have been critical of certain elements of what Israel has done. Uh, what can the United States do within the region to attempt to maintain relationships, not just with Israel, but beyond Israel, and contribute to more stability versus less stability? I think there's consensus in the region, particularly amongst U.S. allies, that U.S. leadership is crucial to the political solution of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. I think that most people understand that um, here in Washington, and, and particularly amongst the Biden administration. We've seen very intensive, you know, marathon-like diplomacy since the beginning of October 7th. Um, but of course, the United States' closest ally in the region is Israel. Um, it is the number one recipient of uh, U.S. Um, uh, assistance. Um, and there is a very um, uh, st strategic and very uh, special relationship between the two countries. And so the only country that can yield most influence um, with the Israeli government is the United States. And I think the Arab leaders and the Arab governments, particularly surrounding Israel, you know, the Jordan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, the, the UAE, these two last countries had signed um, the Abraham Accords Agreements, normalizing relations with Israel. All of these countries understand very well how crucial it is that they engage in diplomacy, that, um, that the U.S. lead that uh, effort, um, and um, basically pressure Israel where it where needed, particularly when it comes to the way it conducts its war in Gaza, uh, to protect civilians, to facilitate much needed humanitarian aid. Um, and that's why you also see the United States working very hard with its key partners and interlocutors, um, Qatar and Egypt, on a hostage um, deal that would um, also include a uh, ceasefire. So all of this is ongoing, and I think um, the Biden administration constantly emphasizes the de-escalation um, you know, goal as a primary goal because it will just you know, mean that we're going to see more months of war in Gaza um, and the hostages at risk uh, continuously, more, uh, more death and killing in, in Gaza, whether it's due to famine or due to um, military uh, activities uh, or the war conducted in, Israel, in, in Gaza by Israel. So that, that is where the U.S. role is crucial. Well, Marissa, I want to thank you and your colleagues for continuing to expand our understanding of what's happening. And certainly in the last six months since the attack on Israel and its response in Gaza, you've been all over it. And we really appreciate that. Thank you want so to much, tell John. You're welcome. And, I, and thank you for today as well. And I, and I want to tell our, our viewers and listeners, uh, if you're interested in learning more, you can visit wilsoncenter.org. And if you use the programs tab that you'll see at the top of the screen, you can find the Middle East program and all the work that I mentioned that Marissa and her colleagues have been doing. Lots of valuable content. And speaking of that, we'll be back with another episode of Need to Know soon. Until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molesky. Thank you for your time and your interest.